Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another Monday's of the Specialty BMR. Today, we will have Infectious Disease BMR, which, of course, I'm not biased at all. But uh, I hope that you have a great time, just as I will. And today, we have Dr. Wasim Abdullah, who is an Emory, Emory Infectious Disease Fellow. So can you introduce yourself? Of course, uh, yeah. So I'm uh, I'm Wasim. You can call me Wasim. Like, feel free. Uh, no need for uh, for titles. And then, so I I grew up actually in Lebanon. Uh, did my med school uh, and everything there, and then came to Indiana University in Indianapolis. Did uh, infection internal medicine residency, chief resident, and then uh, I'm a second year infectious disease fellow now at Emory. My focus is mostly uh, TB uh, and TB related like uh, research, I guess, in within infectious disease. Oh, that's very interesting. And aside from TB and infectious diseases, what do you like to do in your free time? Yeah, uh, I mean, I hang out a lot. Yusuf uh, is a friend of mine. So uh, we hang out, like try new restaurants, bars and whatnot. Um, I do play like a new instrument that I started playing recently. So I do that um, on a regular basis called Oud, O-U-D. Mm. It's a Middle Eastern um, music instrument, kind of a bit similar to a, uh, a guitar and a violin, like kind of somewhere in between the two. So uh, I like to do that as well. That's amazing. Yeah, like it is like uh, the child of a mandolin, a violin, and like a little small guitar. Yeah, it's really nice. So, uh, without further ado, uh, today we have Amazing Fitting presenting a case. And would you like to introduce yourself, Hui Oh, sure. Uh, my name is Hui Ting. I am a medical graduate from Venezuela. And I've been with the team for several months now. And today I'm very happy to be presenting a case. Um, just um, full disclosure, this is not my case. Uh, this uh, case was provided by one of our team member, Dr. Alec. Uh, so yes, we're happy to showcase his case. That's amazing. And thank you, Dr. Alec, whenever you watch this on YouTube. And without further ado, we can start with the case. Um, yep. Yep. So I'm going to start off with the chief complaint. Uh, it's a 55 years old man with diarrhea, fever, and rash. Uh, Dr. Was Wasim, if you want me to stop here, or I can give you a little bit um, HPI. Uh, yeah, let's give, um, let's give more HPI. It's a pretty broad. Yeah. Chief yeah. Yep, got it. No problem. So this is a little bit about the timeline of the presentation. So five days prior to the presentation, um, the patient has non bloody diarrhea with nausea and decreased oral intake, no dysphagia and no odinophagia. And then two days prior to presentation, the patient refer fever and chills. And one day prior to presentation, um, he has erythematous spot over the chest, abdomen, and extremities. I can give you the review system if you want as well. Uh, sure. Yeah, let's go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So uh, for the review system, it's mostly pertinent and negative. Uh, so the patient has no abdominal pain, no dyspnea, chest pain, vomiting, neck pain, photophobia, swelling, cough, or headache. And the patient was admitted. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, this is like a kind of a not so uncommon presentation. Uh, somebody who who seems to be like a, a middle-aged person, male, who's presenting with, I would say, some non-specific symptoms overall. Um, can you tell me more, like, so was there, like, abdominal pain? Oh, no, you said no abdominal pain mm -hmm. at all. Mm -mm. Got it. No. Okay. And then any jaundice that was mentioned or anything about that? No, uh, on skin, right. only the rash. 
got it. Mm -hmm. And then any change in the color of the stool or any change in color of the urine that happened? No. Got it. Okay. And then any, like, I know you said non-bloody diarrhea, but uh, was there any vomiting that happened? Uh, no. Uh, so no so only bloody diarrhea with nausea, uh, but no vomiting. So non-bloody diarrhea, you, mm -hmm. you said, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is this diarrhea related to food intake or like, is it like, does it happen after eating or drinking or is it just... Um, I it guess looks like, yeah. it looks like it's not, um, it's unrelated. Got it. So I guess, I mean, what I'm trying to see here, and I guess that would be like interesting to mention is like looking at a, at a diarrhea, I guess we need to dissect a little bit things and then try to put them, uh, later together. But, uh, so we have, we have a diarrhea. We're trying to, you know, explain it a little bit more and try to understand it, understand this diarrhea a little bit more. So the two things that that you're trying to look at is is this like a like an invasive diarrhea or a non-invasive diarrhea? And there are like few symptoms that I'm trying in my head when I like hear somebody presenting with diarrhea is trying to understand the difference between uh, between the two. So first thing I mean looking at is fever. Um, so obviously fever is more like in in uh, would be put like this diarrhea more in the group of like invasive diarrhea, but also at the same time, bloody or non-bloody also would be helpful, like to looking if there was blood in the stool. So the fact that there was no blood in the stool kind of like makes it uh, a bit more like in between. Um, there is another important uh, symptom to look at. So other question, other than if you saw blood in the stool, another question that would be important to mention also is you saw mucus or something that looks like snot or mucusy in the stool. Um, so that's that's like another one uh, that's like important to mention. So uh, any idea if there was any like mucus or any mention of mucus in the stool? No. No mention. No, got it. Then there's another symptom that is related to. It's called like tenesmus, which uh, you know everyone is probably kind of like have heard that before or seen it. So it's this feeling, urgent feeling to go poop, but then once you go to defecate, uh, there is not much basically that comes up. So there's this like this urgent, this urge to. So was that present? So if that was present, then that would be more like in the invasive. No, side. no, that's the worst thing. Got it. Mm -hmm. And then the other question, like overall about this diarrhea, we're talking about like how many, so it's kind of like the understanding better that symptom and that presentation is like knowing when you say diarrhea, like how many times are we talking about? Because uh, that definition of diarrhea is... Um, they try to objectify it, objectify it as much as possible because it's like, um, you know, one loose stool is not really a diarrhea if, unless it's like a huge amount. Uh, so the, there, you know, GI people have like their also description, like very detailed description of how like the stool would look like and types of stool and whatnot. So how many times did this patient have bowel movements? What was the amount? Um, was it watery? Was it so that would be interesting as well to know about this. Do you know more about like the the the, the amount of stool, the frequency? Um, it wasn't described. So I think there was just one um episode. I think loose stool one episode. That's what it was referred. One episode of loose stools. Mm -hmm. Got it. Within the last like five days. It's yes. not like a, it's, it's not like a daily thing that's happening. No, I think it looks like that um, it started uh, five days ago. This patient had this presentation and then the other day, just fever and chill. And then the, the last day uh, started to have the rash. OK, got it. So. Um, so we're looking at at this, like maybe then an episode of loose, like loose tools that happen in setting of um, of maybe like not feeling well, malaise and whatnot, and then progressed into later on uh, uh, fever. Um, okay. Then I guess we talked a little bit about this, um, this 
diarrhea or uh, loose stool. So better than understanding this, the other symptoms that are happening with this, the fever and chills. So kind of also, again, like starting trying to define it a little bit better. So what are we talking about? Like did the patient, how did the patient know that they were having fever? Well, just subject the, the patient didn't take temperature. Got it. So two days prior to presenting, the patient felt that they were having a fever. Just subject okay. mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Uh, then another symptom that's commonly kind of mentioned with fever is chills. Um, the, the preferred uh, term, I think, in, in, in terms of like getting more accurate description from patients, because everyone like has this feeling of chills from time to time. It's a very... Um, almost like everyone feels it like maybe like every day. So the question is more like rigors is like a much more um, stronger symptom that fits more with what we worry about when we're talking about chills. So rigors may say, asking the patient, have you had shivering from cold? Um, and that would be like a, like a better to understand if that's actually happening or not. So was that within the symptoms or was it just like feeling like, a bit chilly i think it's just uh as if from the patient it's more subjective i think it's more chivalry according to the case more than rigor okay got it mm -hmm. uh all right so and then we get i guess to the physical exam after and getting to know better about this um this fever since we all we know is that it's um it's a subjective uh, temperature uh, did the patient have it like continuously or that was like the patient feeling better? Did the patient take anything to try to help um, with this uh, fever? It looks like uh, the patient had continuously. The patient didn't take anything for the fever. Okay. So fever continued for like two days and the patient eventually like uh, presented. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and then, okay. So, and then we'll get to the third, I guess, symptom that is here. So the kind of dissecting again and trying to start to think about like, oh, what is going on here? So you said there is this erythematous rash uh, that's over the chest, abdomen, and extremities that's sparing the hands and feet. So interesting, um, uh, you know, mentioning that it does spare the, the hands and feet in this patient. Um, so did it start, do, you know, do we know where it started? like this rash? Um, it looks like the trunk area, like chest and abdomen. Got it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and then it spread more like, like peripherally yeah, like after, that. got it, okay. Um, do, do we know more like about this rash? Is it, so we said erythematous, is it like, like small nodules, papules? Is it like macular only? Like I think it's macular. Raised? You will describe it. So non-raised, non-raised. Is it like a confluent rash? Like is it something like a rash that's just like, or is it like small it spots? Like a particular macular particular type of rash. Got it. Okay. I mean, we'll get to know better, I guess, on, on physical exam. Is that rash getting worse? Or is that, is that rash just kind of the same? Uh, sort of stayed the same. It didn't get worse. Okay. Uh, so spread extremities, spared the hands and feet and stayed the same. Okay. Uh, was this patient the only one who was sick around them, like in that setting, or does that happening with like other people as well around um, them? Uh, actually, I can give you the past medical history if you want to. Um, you. Sure. Let's 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 yeah. Let's get to the past medical history. I don't know if uh, if Yasmin has like anything in the yeah, meantime. I do. Mm -hmm. I actually was waiting. Uh, I yeah. have a question <laughs> Go ahead. for you. Uh, thank you. It is uh, for rash and fever. The convergence of that presenting in a patient may have a broad di diagnosis, differential diagnosis. Uh, Dr. Wazim, what do you think could be the top? differential diagnosis whenever we see a patient with this kind of presentation? Yeah, so it's like a very, I mean, a skin, biggest organ of the body. So you're like, um, you know, any disease kind of like affecting it. It's like, just like from a probability, mathematical probability perspective, it's an organ that gets affected by uh, a lot of systemic uh, illnesses. Fever goes without saying, it's like a very, very common. So we're going with a very, very broad, 
differential and um, you know the exposures and history and all that stuff will be uh, very important to, uh, to 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 kind of like start making more like increasing and decreasing the chances of one diagnosis or the other. But I guess my my approach, and that would be everybody will have like a different way to do it. But my approach is to thinking about two two things at this state when I'm just like I've heard only what I've heard so far is one looking at two things. One, what is like the common, the most common diagnoses that are associated with such a presentation? Uh, after understanding, this is mostly a fever and a rash with like maybe some malaise and like non-specific symptoms that preceded it, like prodromal symptoms that were happening for a few days prior. And then um, and, and then it's like at some point, I guess I didn't uh, I didn't ask you, we, but uh, but like what what was prompted the patient kind of to come to the hospital? Like this has been going on for five days. Last two days have been maybe a bit worse. But was there anything that like triggered the patient to like say, oh, I need to go to the hospital? Um, actually, it's just um, it's the evolution of the symptom because it didn't uh, improve. Didn't go away. So. Yes. The patient right. is to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I guess here, um, and and we're talking about a patient here. Are we geographically? Where are we? Like, uh, is that like here in the U.S. or somewhere else? And I guess maybe that goes again for like the social history. So let let me let me I guess not not go there first. Um, but I would say I start with the simple like diagnosis, the common diagnosis that happens. So remember that. Even when we're at CP solvers case, which obviously like everyone is expecting something, you know, that's that's there. But still, always it's important to remember that common things are common. And there's one thing that my uh, professor med school told me once is that uh, uh, uncommon presentations of common diseases is more common than common presentations of uncommon diseases. So always keep in mind that common stuff are common for a reason and that the likelihood of you seeing that common disease is more likely than seeing the uncommon kind of uh, So that's number one. And number two to think about is like what's deadly requiring like high, having high morbidity? What are the diagnoses that have high morbidity mortality where I can intervene on and that would decrease the chances of that morbidity mortality, which means better outcomes for my patient. Those are the two the two things that I'm thinking about. So if you want to start just like basic uh, thinking of the differential, I would say, oh, is this like a viral illness? Like, is this like a like a viral illness that's there? And viruses are like a lot of viruses. So we can go from, oh, is this like COVID-19 with like maybe a bit of an uncommon presentation of COVID-19 or the flu, and I don't know if you guys mean you want me to go to like specific differentials, or you just wanted like to talk about about like general like categories. You can just for the sake of the time, just for yeah. categories. Yeah. So I mean, I, yeah, it can start with like common viruses to maybe like HIV, which is also a virus that we shouldn't forget about. That's like there to like travel related viruses. You know, like talking about. Uh, chikungunya, talking about uh, about dengue, talking about you know yellow fever and all that stuff, uh, and and then you can go to bacterial illnesses. Oh, I mean like rickettsial viruses, but also like bacteria related rickettsial uh, illnesses is another one uh, to keep keep in mind. To go to uh, you know uh, fungal infections, you know. Coccidioides, uh, paracoccidioides, I don't know, the, again, the travel history of the patient, uh, two parasitic infections as well. So this is a very, very like a broad differential at this point. I don't know yet the GI involvement in it as much to help me kind of like start in my head to differentiate things because like that would be helpful. But uh, that that's, I guess, my first, uh, my first Thinking so the, the common sorry I, I guess I start with the common things but I included with them the what's like more deadly so a Rocky Mountain spotted fever would be more in the high morbidity mortality like maybe less common but then that's something that I need to know about because like 
thinking about it means maybe intervention that would decrease uh, decrease that mortality in the in 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 my patient. So um, so that's kind of like a, a first a first thought when I'm starting to see this uh, this patient. Oh, that's that's really good to know. Like honestly, we have all been thinking about, especially coming from the Caribbean and tropical areas. Normally, I see I see the chat also thinking about any uh, vector-borne disease. But without further ado, Hutin, can you give us more information, please? Sure. Great discussion so far. Uh, so the past medical history, the patient is HIV positive. Um, he's taking his medication, um, so specifically Bicarbi. Uh, um, so he report um, excellent adherence. So he's taking his medication, uh, is very compliant. Uh, in regard to social history, to answer your question, Dr. Wasim, uh, this patient lived in Texas. Um, so he's sexually active with multiple partners with inconsistent condom use. Uh, works as a shelter caring for dogs and cat. So no sick contact, no recent traveling, and no tobacco, alcohol, or illicit drug use. I can stop here or I can give you a physical exam. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I guess, <laughs> at this point, like a uh, very important uh, information that was, uh, that was brought to us. Uh, so this patient has HIV. Uh, so that's puts... So again, thinking about the syndrome, so we were thinking first about like a febrile uh, syndrome with non-specific symptoms. That's one acute, I guess I would put it still within the five days. So this thinking always about the case, putting it in a syndrome will help you a lot in terms of like differential. So one, this is a febrile syndrome uh, with non-specific symptoms, uh, maybe GI involvement, question mark, in, uh, in a person who has HIV, so potentially either currently immune compromised, even though you're saying the patient has been uh, to taking their Bictar V and probably that puts them more in like a very mildly immune, immune suppressed, but don't forget that this patient has been potentially at some point immune uh, suppressed. So it's important to know here for how long has this patient had HIV? Uh, do we know more about their like HIV control, I guess that would be uh, another one, another thing to think about. So do we know for how long has the patient has a, had HIV? Uh, it doesn't report exactly the year, but it looks like it's been uh, for several years, but he's always been complying with his medication. Got, got, okay. Um, has this patient had before any like infections related to the H to HIV? Um, it was not reported. Not reported, okay. Um, and then, so, so that's, that's, I mean, understanding a bit their immune status puts the patient again, the syndrome thinking is like, okay, we talked about like describe the syndrome, but then the question is, what's the host? Like, who's the host? And then lastly, in the context, like, what's the context? Is it the context, uh, zoonotic exposure? Is the context travel? Is the context, uh, uh you know, that's, those are the things also to think about. So now we're still in in the context of somebody who's HIV, who's potentially seems like not very immune compromised, uh, based at least on what I heard so far, uh, with uh, high risk sexual behavior. So uh, multiple sexual partners, inconsistent uh, condom use, and in contact at a shelter, so so just uh, sorry, I'm even just trying to understand this shelter is uh, so it's a shelter for humans that also has cats and dogs, or is it a shelter specifically for cats and dogs? Cats and dogs, animal okay. shelter. Yeah. <laughs> so got it. So being like around uh, around animals, and there's only dogs and cats in there. Mm -hmm. Got. It. Okay. Um, I guess those are like some of the information we wanted to know about any recent travel outside of Texas or is that Texas like the only place? Okay. No, was not reported travel outside yeah. of Texas. Got it. And is that like a native Texan or is that is it a person who moved from somewhere else? I Texas? think it's native in Texas. Mm -hmm. Got it. uh, any um, 
raw meat consumption, unpasteurized milk consumption, um, any other like types of exposures, I guess. No. Not working on a like a no farm or anything other than that shelter with the dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. That's uh, right. And what time of the year are we in Texas now? Is that um, is that like summer, winter, in between? Um, I do not have that information. You got it. Okay. So my question is leading to: Is there any tick bite, mosquito bites? Like, is there any mention of of that? It does not mention about mosquito. Okay. Any recent hiking trip? Uh, went somewhere that could have exposure, I guess, lakes, anything like that? No. Nothing to be no. mentioned? No. Got it. Okay. Uh, all right. And, and I guess that's maybe not relevant much for this case, but uh, since you mentioned Texas and we we're talking about like the high morbidity mortality things, like malaria, for example, is a high morbidity mortality illness that I have to like keep in mind and pair people with like having fever. And Texas did have a, a native case of uh, like a locally transmitted uh, 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 malaria that happened two months ago. So that's something I know that this is not like we didn't hear a history of travel, but I wanted to mention that. So there were like five cases in Florida. And uh, one or two cases I forgot in Texas uh, that were native, like locally transmitted. So uh, keeping also uh, also malaria in the differential diagnosis would be uh, would be very very helpful. Um, yeah, I think those are like my my first like thoughts. Okay, let's I guess let's go to maybe uh, the physical exam. Dr. Vasim, before we, yeah. before we oh, go on, I'm so sorry for <laughs> um, uh, amazing thoughts, by the way. And I also have a couple of questions. Um, in this, in patients with HIV and on ART, would you consider diarrhea as a secondary or adverse effect of the treatment? The, the diarrhea as a side effect of the HIV treatment, you said? Yes. So... I mean, everything can cause diarrhea, right? This is a very, uh, very common side effect. If you look at any medication, like in the in the potential adverse events, um, it would be weird for this to to be like happening. I mean, I don't know when this big target was started. I didn't get the feel that this is like a new medication that was initiated. Um, but but it would be weird for it to like suddenly uh, suddenly start, yeah. Um, any other medication that I guess this is like a moment to to think about like anything else that was taken recently, anything over the counter, any change in medication that happened? No, he only takes uh, the antiretroviral. Okay. That's the only medication. I also have okay. another question. In a patient like this, if you are, uh, whenever you see this patient on the hospital, would you start, uh, would you advise starting empiric antibiotic therapy or would you rather wait for studies? What would be your conduct to follow with an immuno immunocompromised patient? Yeah, yeah, thank you for this question. So this is very helpful. So again, in, in that, uh, so two things you're thinking about, right? We're thinking about the common things that are like common and trying to figure out that this patient falls within the common diagnoses. And we're thinking about morbidity mortality, right? So while you're creating that morbidity mortality uh, differential, that's the group that you want, you want to intervene on if there is a way to intervene on it, right? So uh, if this is RMSF, then I want to start something. like I Because RMSF is associated with very high mortality, uh, and the treatment for it is not associated itself with like very high morbidity mortality. So kind of risks benefit looking at it in that perspective. That makes me think, no, I want to start something that would have an effect on these specific diagnoses that are uh, like high risk. So starting from like non-infection, like like uh, I guess non-infectious perspective, I'm thinking, okay, is there anything in the differential that requires like intervention acutely? I'm as an infectious disease consultant, I may be like a bit more focused on infectious disease, but it does this patient have like I don't know. Uh, 
a PE and then like had like DVT somewhere or like um, um, uh, like uh, what's it called like a liver uh, a portal vein thrombosis having like jaundice or having some GI symptoms in that setting and and this is the cause of their fever and then for some reason that caused a rash so it's like uh, thinking about these things is maybe more like the other teams that are involved in the care for me is like okay, is this malaria? So I'm going to have to look for malaria. Two, is this uh, Rocky Mountain maybe or some rickettsial illness? So I would start doxycycline. Now, are you asking, do you start the like the big gun, broad spectrum antibiotics? I haven't heard the physical exam yet. Uh, so I wouldn't like jump, but I would say in general, the indications for starting antibiotics in ID are actually limited for like urgent use of antibiotics. One of them is obviously somebody is in septic shock. So somebody is in septic shock, no question is asked that antibiotics are needed urgently, obvious decrease in mortality. Two, febrile neutropenia, no questions asked, even if the patient looks as stable as a patient could look. If the patient is neutropenic, this patient needs to be started immediately on broad spectrum antibiotics, specifically targeting gram negatives. So that's that would be another one where the mortality goes down from 70% to 30%. So that's like known we should start. Meningitis is a third one where like we need to immediately start antibiotics within the like an hour of like arriving to the ED or like getting in contact with that patient. If you're able to do that lumbar puncture quicker, that'd be great. If not, like start antibiotics. Uh, also is associated with, with decreased mortality. And then infections like RMSF and things like that that require um, antibiotics. Outside of that, I wouldn't jump. So I would say so far from hearing this story, I wouldn't like start very broad spectrum antibiotics like blindly, but I would probably start doxycycline just from what I've heard so far. Oh, thank you so much. I think we can get the third adequate. Sure. Um, so for the physical exam, uh, the vital sign is temperature 102 Fahrenheit, uh, heart rate 120, and uh, blood pressure is 95 over 64, uh, respiratory rate 24, um, oxygen saturation is 96% on room air. Um, so the patient is awake, alert, and the cardiovascular um, system um, has tachycardia without murmur, chest, normal breath sound, no crackles, um, abdomen uh, soft, non-tender, non-distended, no re rebound or guarding. And the skin, there's a scattered erythematous macules across the trunk and extremities. That's for the physical exam. Um, I can go ahead with some of the labs if you want, or I can stop here. Yeah, so I, I, let's let's just uh, start maybe for a couple couple seconds. So so we're looking at somebody who is having a temperature of thirty seven point eight, not super high. His heart rate is a bit higher than you would expect just from the temperature. So it's important to look at the temperature and the heart rate and the blood pressure together. Like this combo helps a lot in terms of like one in the differential, but two in like terms of like, okay, am I gonna intervene now as an infectious disease person or as a doctor in general or not? So looking at the temperature, 37.8 doesn't really fall within like the fever category, but it's like a temperature. Could, could, did you say uh, 102 initially? Or was it like, because I think 102 should be higher than 37.8. Sorry. Um, yes, it is 100.2, 100, uh, 100 but it's Fahrenheit. 100.2. 102. 102. Okay. So this is like, so it's like higher than, so this is actually a fever then. Uh, is, if it's 102 instead of 100.2. 0. 0.2. 0.2, sorry, sorry, then it's not. <laughs> so this is like in the category of like maybe low grade, I guess I would put it. Uh, and associated with it, we have a blood pressure that looks a bit low and uh, a, a, a heart rate that's that's high, that's in the uh, tachycardia range. With a patient who's like breathing quickly a little bit uh, and setting, I mean, 96%, but it's not like the best uh, saturation that I've seen before. 
So one thing to look at, and that would be like a helpful and in, in for you to look at in the future, and maybe not relevant for this case, is the dissociation between the heart rate and the temperature. So let's say somebody comes to you with a temperature of 102 or 103 instead of 100.2 or 0.3, and their heart rate is 70, then there are a few things that can cause that. One, if the patient is on beta blocker, which this patient is not, but then other things like are, uh, you know, typhoid fever. Typhoid fever is like very commonly associated with this like dissociation between uh, the temperature and relative bradycardia for these. So their heart rate is like 80 and their temperature is 39. So that would be like one thing to think about. Legionella as well can cause that sometimes. So that's another one, uh, another one to, to think about. Now, so this patient looks uncomfortable, moderately uncomfortable, just from like looking at the vitals. Uh, is this because the patient is like going into a septic shock or is that because the patient uh, is a bit dehydrated because they've been like ill and not eating and drinking well and having like high temperature and kind of like losing fluid, extracellular fluid, like over the last uh, few days. So that again, like in terms of like Yasmin's question, like, are you going to jump on antibiotics? I would maybe like the first thing to do is maybe give the patient like some fluids in addition to the doxycycline and then see if the patient responds and blood pressure improves. If not, then I would be more inclined to like start maybe broader antibiotics at that, at that point. Um, yeah. And all right. So I guess maybe we can, we can, we can go. And, and by the way, sorry, before that, did we see any like lesions inside of the mouth, like in the patient or in the, like the mucous membranes? No. No okay. No okay. And because again, we think about the common things, but maybe then the bit uncommon things like measles, like looking for coplic signs, uh, like inside of the mouth, other lesions. If this is non-infectious, uh, like related to like a new medication, which is not the case in this patient, you know, looking for uh, Lyme syndrome, Steven Johnson, and like uh, and like all that stuff. So this seems like is the mucous membranes are intact. All right. We can maybe go to uh, some basic workup. Great discussion. So I'm going to go ahead to the labs. Um, so the white blood cell, um, they were with the normal limit, uh, hemoglobin 10, uh, platelet 120,000, uh, uh, sodium 124, creatinine 1.5, AST 388, ALT 295, uh, CD4 count is 126, uh, the HIV viral load zero, and the patient also had peripheral blood smear without schistocyte. And yep, that's the basic uh, lab that I have for now. Dr. Lucim, sorry for interrupting. Mm -hmm. I am really, I'm really wondering before you start uh, tackling the labs, is that if this CD count will uh, situate you or relate it to like relate, make you think about a specific diagnosis or change your way of tackling the case. Uh, considering this patient has diarrhea, like would you think in a specific um, etiology? If you have see if you see this CD4 count, this CD4 count in patient with diarrhea, fever, and rash. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um... I mean, a lot of things came to my mind now in the last like uh, 30 seconds after like seeing those labs. So one, well, first thing, even though the white blood cell count is normal, I'm very interested in differential uh, on that white blood cell count. And that would be relevant for like the CD4. So is, is, is it also like a normal, like differential on the white blood cells? But normal, yeah. Okay. Because what happens in the acute illness, you can have a obviously a, a drop in the lymphocytes because acute setting uh, illness causes increase in the uh, like endo uh, corticosteroid secretions uh, from the adrenal glands. And that causes an immediate apoptosis of everything that's not neutrophil pretty much. So lymphocytes will go down, eosinophils will disappear and all that stuff. So, uh, and that happens pretty quickly. So, uh, and that might explain maybe a number of CD4. So as you know, CD4, the normal 
I mean, what's normal, but like normal, maybe talking about like above 800, but then what we target in HIV patients being above 200, because that helps a lot in terms of like putting, having to put these patients on, on, uh, uh, on like prophylaxis for opportunistic infections or not. And that puts them in that category of opportunistic infections. Um, is, do we have a percentage of the CD4? Because that's another thing in acute illness that I look at that's probably more important than the CD4 count number itself is the percentage. Because even though I mentioned that, that, that the acute illness might cause a decrease in lymphocytes and the factor decrease in uh, uh, T lymphocytes and the factor decrease in CD4 T lymphocytes, but then, but then the percentage should not be as much affected. Uh, and so, as we know, we target a percentage of 13 to 15 percent uh, uh, and above for a more appropriate uh, HIV level. So I'm interested to see what's the percentage here in this with this patient. Unfortunately, I don't have the percentage of the reporting. Got it. Do we know at baseline, like, do we have any, like, prior, is this like a 126 that suddenly happened, or is that a patient who's been running in that range before I any idea it happened yeah okay what so this is not usual, this is not his usual cd4 count mm -hmm. yeah so i mean again so asking yes means question so yes this patient is definitely now in my head and the maybe moderate immune compromised patient is that the patient i'm gonna like immediately think oh this is like intestinal tb that's like flaring up or like a cmv colitis Probably not yet. They're not based on on what I know. Looking at like oh, there's like severe immune compromise related uh, diarrhea, you know, and especially that the, the diarrhea itself is a questionable one, right? We have like one loose bowel movement that happened. Uh, cryptosporidiosis. I mean, that's like a definitely more common. Makes me maybe a bit think, but cryptosporidiosis is a very like diarrhea. There's just like you lose a lot of fluid in a very short period of time. And that doesn't sound like what this patient had. It's just patient had like one loose bowel movement and kind of like had seems like maybe a constipation or regular bowel movements afterwards. Uh, so I wouldn't like immediately start thinking about the GI related immune compromised illnesses, if that's your question. Yes, mean as of yet, uh, especially with that the diarrhea did not persist. Yes, that's like chasing it when it's not like the main uh, the main thing. But what caught my attention, obviously, we have the sodium of 124, which could be multifactorial. So uh, it would be interesting here to look like at osmolarity of the blood and looking at the like, causes of uh, of like the hyponatremia. Is this a hy hypovolemic hyponatremia? Is this the euvolemic hyponatremia? Or this is a hypervolemic uh, hyponatremia? Uh, and so all those are important to know. It doesn't seem like this patient has at least a baseline history of like heart disease that would put them at risk for heart failure, like uh, acute heart failure, put them in like causing uh, hypervolemic hyponatremia, um, uh, even though there is like some creatinine elevation. And then, so hypovolemic in the setting of maybe some diarrhea and decreased intake. Uh, but then also I'm thinking about SIADH inducing illnesses at this point that could cause the sodium to uh, to drop with while being kind of euvolemic. So think about lung disease. So we all talk about like lung disease whenever we mention somebody's maybe a bit tachypnic setting, not that great, even though the physical exam did not really, was not really worrying for, for a pneumonia. But then thinking about Legionnaire's disease, I think is uh, is like, reasonable. Other pulmonary, I mean, the reason hyponatremia happens and is not only, I mean, maybe Legionnaires causes it a bit more than other bacteria, but actually that's not a specific finding for Legionnaires disease. Uh, it's it's more of a specific thing for lung disease. Uh, you know, as you know, small cell, small cell lung cancer causes also hyponatremia, also by SIADH. So it's like really more of a lung infection related thing than a, than a Legionnaire, Legionella related thing. So I'm thinking now maybe something, uh, you know, happening, happening in the lungs, potentially Legionnaire's disease. In fact, I want to mention here that Legionnaire's disease, the specific finding on, on workup is actually hypophosphatemia and not hyponatremia. Hypophosphatemia does not happen with other, like pneumonia and does happen 
uh, with pretty much only with Legionnaires. So if you find hypophosphatemia and somebody who has pneumonia, I, I want you to think about, about Legionnaires. It's not a very sensitive finding, but it's a specific finding. Uh, now that that Legionnaires, that hypophosphatemia resolves pretty quickly. So it's like find, found only in the first day of the, the illness. So it might you might not find it if you see the patient two, three days later. Uh, but we have uh, platelets that are decreased and we have a moderate elevation of AST and ALT. So, uh, so that's, those are important things to, to think about. Again, making maybe Legionnaire's disease in my head, like starting to look more like, oh, this is like, you know, this GI involvement, maybe some lung involvement, hyponatremia, elevation and LFTs, starting to make kind of a bit sense. Do we have a Billy Rubin? Maybe I like I misheard. But do we talk about Billy Rubin, uh, Alc no, Fox? So. Those were yeah. So it's really like just elevation uh, in those. I mean, rickettsial illnesses. Also, I would still keep those in mind at this point. I would still be very um, concerned about about those as well. Uh, Story is a one that's in Texas. Uh, like as a tick-borne illness. Uh, so that's like another one uh, to think about. Um, even Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I don't know if we've mentioned where in Texas the patient lives, but um, but those as well, I would I would still keep them in mind. Dr. Basim, for the amazing summary summary of the diagnosis, I believe this patient is in Houston, Texas, and uh, I will ask the thing to give us the rest of the adequate so we can keep on um, going the discussion. Got it. The time. So yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah, and, and just, just I guess before something also like very important. Sorry, not to also man, like forget. Uh, it's it's non bloody diarrhea, but enterohemorrhagic E. coli. If you don't give it antibiotics first, it can cause like HUS like illness, right? So we have creatinine elevation. We have a hemoglobin that's uh, that's a bit decreased. We did not see schistocytes, so that's like not not really like in favor of it. But we have the thrombocytopenia, so that's something also to keep in mind in like terms of looking at this patient. Is that's also uh, a hemolytic uremic syndrome is still on the on the differential as well. I think that's that's important to mention in the uh, kind of high risk, high morbidity, high mortality uh, diagnosis. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for reminding us that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. This is the last aloqua before I review the, um, um, the diagnosis. So this patient in the second day of hospital uh, stay, he persists with fever, but now he developed encephalopathy. And then uh, the team performed uh, different studies, um, which is all negative blood cultures, stool studies, lumbar puncture, uh, treponema, antibody was negative as well, urine, oropharyngeal, and rectal gonorrhea, chlamydia, PCR, negative. And then hepatitis A, B, and C was also negative. So the patient also uh, had a CT abdomen, which only revealed hepatospinomegaly. And in the fifth day of his hospital stay, um, so the I, IgM and IgG antibody testing for murin typhus drawn in day one came back negative. And as you said, uh, so the team uh, initiated with doxycycline and with the resolution of the symptoms. And I have just one more piece of data before the diagnosis. So yeah, I don't know if you uh, want to discuss a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's um, that's an interesting one. I mean, serology, so serology is, is obviously one of the most common way to diagnose a lot of these illnesses. That being said, keep in mind that serology is, um, is like uh, you know a limited by time, right? So you're we've had that with COVID nineteen and all that looking for SARS CoV two antibodies and whatnot in people who just got the disease. So it will take some time sometimes for serology to turn positive. So 
I wouldn't use a serologic test in somebody who just had the illness started five days ago or less to decide if like I want to rule in or rule out uh, the diagnosis. I think it's important to keep also in mind like other uh, differential that, I, that are important. I mean, you mentioned uh, hepatitis serologies, but also CMV, EBV, those are also illnesses that can cause like a mononucleosis-like illness that also should be very important to keep in mind uh, when, when dealing uh, with these presentations. It can cause a rash as well. Toxoplasma with this cat exposure can cause a mononucleosis-like uh, illness. Uh, Bartonellosis, you know, that's also something to, uh, to to keep in mind in that in that setting as well with the exposure to to the uh, especially to the cat and if there's like any cat scratch. So taking into consideration all these things when you mentioned hepatosplenomegaly, kind of like I like uh, on the CT scan, like I kind of started to think about uh, uh, about about these things a little bit more um, as well. But my first comment in, in terms of the murine typhus IgM, IgG being negative, I my first reaction would be, okay, I wouldn't like necessarily use that to rule out the diagnosis. I would potentially repeat uh, that serologic testing, uh, maybe like at one week, like you know difference and then like repeat them and see if they turn positive uh, that would be maybe my, my approach so far dr Hazim, how would you summarize this case in this patient that presented with diarrhea fever rash that's immunocompromised what would you be your summary of the case yeah so i would say this is a 55 year old male uh with, who is mildly to moderately uh immune compromised uh, with some context of high sexual zoonotic exposures, uh, who is presenting with uh, a, 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 a systemic uh, inflammatory syndrome with specific involvement of the skin, uh, the liver, and the spleen, I mean, the, and overall, like the, the, like the medullary system, I guess, overall, um, with potentially maybe like a long involvement. I guess that's my, uh, that's so far my, my, my summary, I guess, of the syndrome of this, uh, that this patient has. That's very interesting. I think, um, we can go to the final diagnosis now, Hui. And then after, Dr. Wasi, maybe you can give us two or three teaching points. Yeah. Me. Did we have a chest X-ray or CT chest or any like imaging of the chest? Uh, normal. So they were normal. Okay. Then yeah. Um, yeah. So actually, the diagnosis. I think so many people in the chat already mentioned. Um, so, and this happened um, post discharge, this patient, I mean, he improved with the doxycycline, so the patient was discharged, and he was repeated the antibody um, of the murine typhus, which came back positive. So, I yes, I think you were so right when you were talking about the serology and that it may be not uh, show up positive the first week of presentation. So that's one of the things that I learned from the case. And you were right. So it's a murine typhus case. <laughs> very interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, the patient has some exposure, I guess, some immune system that's not necessarily the you know, the most competent immune system, even though they are not uh, severely immune compromised. Uh, but the, the picture definitely, definitely is, um, fits really well uh, with, with this presentation. Uh, I mean, this is like, and starting doxycycline here, you know, was like the right, uh, like the right decision. Uh, I mean, I, I think this is a great case to present. Like, thank you so much, uh, we for like great presentation. Uh, this is like the beautiful thing about like ID and about intern medicine is looking at, uh, at, at like a very differential diagnosis. It goes from the common things, dangerous things, and then later on slowly start to go to, uh, you know, less common things in the context of exposure, of course, uh, and and eventually finding the diagnosis while taking the right like 
the right decisions initially in terms of like, okay, what's the most dangerous for this patient? And let's start treating that first and then, um, you know, go from there. And at the end of the day, the patient improved in front of your eyes. And so that's more important than the serology is, uh, than the serology kind of result initially. But yeah, definitely serology is, is something to, to take with a, with like very, being very cautious about, about it, because it's, um, it's just something that, uh, that will take time, especially in somebody who's, CD4 cells are are only 126, right? And so 126, and then, you know, as you know, the T cells are the cells that tell, uh, CD4 T cells are the ones that tell B cells to secrete, to, to, to become plasma cells, right? And then to start secreting antibodies. So if you don't have enough of those, it will take you a bit longer to uh, develop like uh, antibodies against anything. Uh, including um, urine typhus. So um, so also it's nice to see kind of the pathophysiology of medicine happening in front of your eyes with like one patient. I think that's uh, uh, the beauty of what we do. Uh, and and yeah, so, so this is great. Yeah, I appreciate you presenting yeah, this. Yeah. Actually, I just want to mention that you said exactly the clinical pearl that Dr. Alec want to mention. So he highlighted with his clinical pearl is the antibody response. So you, I cannot say anything else. You actually hit everything. Thank you so much. You were amazingly. And Dr. Rasim, thank you so much for uh, coming today, joining us this Monday evening. And we really, really appreciate it. And without further ado, we can go with Sarah so she can uh, share with us her teaching points of today. Yeah, thank you everyone for this rich case and discussion. I definitely learned a lot. Um, so we began with a patient who had some kind of non-specific, seemingly infectious illness with a couple of different symptoms. Um, one of them being diarrhea. So the branch points that we initially can think about for diarrhea include invasive symptoms, um, which include fever, blood, mucus, and tenesmus versus non-invasive symptoms. We also had the patient with rash and fever. So our initial approach to that can be uh, considering more common causes, including their uncommon presentations. So that would include viral illnesses like COVID and HIV, as well as travel-related or um, vector-related illnesses. We should also consider uh, uh, illnesses of high morbidity and mortality, including uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, drug-related illnesses like SJS and TEN, and malaria, because that will um, that will influence our management. So we would start targeted therapies urgently if there's a high concern for a highly morbid infection, or we would start broad-spectrum antibiotics for someone who is in sepsis, has febrile neutropenia, or has concern for meningitis because we know that um, starting antibiotics at that time decreases mortality. We also learned in the history that this patient had HIV and was on long-term ART, but we should also consider that they may still have a history of past or current immunocompromised state as was revealed later in the labs. When we moved on to the physical exam, we learned a pearl about heart rate and temperature dissociation, also called uh, fajet sign. Um, although this patient didn't quite have it, we still learned about this pearl that some of the things that can cause this can be uh, drugs like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers or a variety of infections, specifically typhoid fever, Legionella, and some others. And then finally, we got some more information from the labs, um, including a low CD4 count, which again highlights that we um, can have an immunocompromised state, even if someone is on long acting antiretroviral therapies. Um, and we should consider a CD4 target percentages in patients with HIV in conjunction with CD4 count. And so we would target 13 to 15%. We also found that this patient had hyponatremia. So in the context of infectious disease, we would also consider illnesses that cause SIADH, um, including lung disease such as um, Legionnaires, which affects the lungs, as well as some other rickettsial illnesses. And then our final most important pearl is for serology testing, you may have a false negative within an incubation period or within one week of initial presentation. So it may not necessarily rule out a diagnosis. So we would repeat the um, test at a later time if it's still high on our differential and possibly empirically treat, especially in someone who has immunocompromised because they'll have a diminished antibody response. 
And those are all my teaching pearls for today. Thank you so much for the discussion. Thank you so much, Sara, for your teaching points. Thank you, Mario, for your scribing. And we think amazing presentation. <laughs> and again, Dr. Lassim, I hope we can have you again soon. Uh, hopefully we'll have more ID cases. Personally, I love them. And being mindful of your time, I will let you all go. Thank you and see you tomorrow in Focus VMR. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. <laughs>